Our next speaker is Christian, and he's going to talk about verifiable off-chain computing. Yeah, the title of the talk is Verifying Off-Chain Computations, and we've seen many talks that concerned the off-chain part, so uh, state channels, and I'm, I want to concentrate on the verifying part and on the computations part, and you'll see what that means in a minute. Um, yeah, that's a slide about me that was inserted here. <laughs> uh, okay, so what, I what is computation? We're doing, so blockchains are inherently about computation, so what is this abstract thing that we're talking about? And uh, I think in the 1920s, uh, the community, the research community came to a definition of what computation is, and roughly uh, it's kind of a a fixed formalized procedure that you can apply to certain inputs to get certain outputs. And examples of computations are, of course, verifying cryptographic signatures, or uh, in a decentralized exchange, DEX, uh, finding an optimal price assignment for a given set of orders, or when we're talking about uh, blockchains or state channels, uh, you have a given state of the blockchain, you have a sequence of transactions, and you apply these transactions to the state to get a new state. Um, yeah, or yeah, verifying transitions in a state channel, which is basically the same thing as above, just in a state channel. Um, and if we take a closer look, then these computations are all of a kind of a different type. So let's take a look and get some structure into that. Um, the most general of a, uh, form of a computation is a computation that just takes a bunch of inputs and maps them to a bunch of outputs, and both of them can be arbitrary size. And an example of that is computing a state transition. So state plus transaction yields new state. And the new state is, of course, large. And um, Another way to look at computation is to, to simplify it so that you only consider verification problems, also called decision problems, where the input can also be arbitrary, but the output is always binary. It's always either true or false. And an example here is yeah, verifying a given state transition or also verifying a signature, although yeah, you have to be careful there. So the output has to be true or false. It can't be the public key of the signature. Um, and so there's actually an interesting connection between those two. Of course, a verification problem is always a general computation problem because the output can be, there's no, there's no restriction on the output in the general setting. But um, you can transform a general computation into a verification problem by uh, yet taking the output of the general problem and making it an additional input for the verification problem. So you have a computation that turns an input into an output, and then you can, from that you can build another computation that just says, this output is the correct output for that given input, and it says true or false. So you get the output from somewhere, and then you just check whether the computation was correct. And this is kind of... Um, Yeah, I mean, verifying a given state transition, so uh, you first compute the state transition and then say, this is the new post state, and then you can verify it by just basically running it again and checking that actually it is the uh, correct post state, but your output is only yes or no, so it's correct or it's not correct. Um, then uh, there are search problems where... Um, you, you're tasked, you, so you have a certain input, and then you're tasked to find a value that satisfies a property. And proof of work is an example for that. So you have to, uh, so your input is a block without the nonce field filled in, and your task is to find a nonce so that the hash of the block is below a th certain threshold. So that's a search problem. And usually these search problems, um, 
They are usually uh, implemented using just brute force, so you just try out uh, um, all possible inputs until you find something that works. And for some problems, there might be better solutions, but search problems always, so this, this brute force uh, solution that always exists. And then, uh, so, and yeah, so the task is find value that satisfies property. Of course, this whether or not it satisfies the property is again a verification problem. So we again have the connection here. And then um, next class is optimization problems. This is basically a search problem. Plus, in addition to that, um, we, we put a kind of price tag or quality value on each solution and try to find the best solution, whatever that means. And in proof of work, so you again see the connection here. Um, if you do proof of work, you mine a block, but you have two parallel blocks, then uh, depending on how your blockchain is defined, um, the block that has the higher total difficulty wins. So this is so the the task is to kind of find a nonce that produces a very uh, uh, produces a uh, yeah the, the highest total difficulty somehow. Or another example, uh, you have a, a sequence of orders for decentralized exchange, and uh, you want to find. So you, you trade multiple tokens, and you want to find uh, prices for these tokens so that as many orders as possible can be executed. And then, if you have multiple uh, so-called feasible solutions that um, are valid price assignments, then you can compare them. Uh, yeah, regarding how many um, orders will be executed. And um, so now the, the last point here, witness advice. Um, this is not really a computational problem, but something that always uh, is related to these. For example, uh, when we took the general computation problem and turned it into a verification problem, then the, the output kind of came from somewhere. And uh, this is always called witness or advice. So we have an additional input where we don't care where it comes from. And uh, sometimes we assume that it's, it's correct and sometimes we don't assume it, but we still try to use it for our computation. So, uh, for example, when, yeah, when we... Um, when we verify transactions, then we check the signatures, and the signatures can be seen as advice because uh, we don't. It, it helps. <laughs> yeah, that's perhaps a bad example. We'll we'll have better examples later. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, better example for advice. Um, Finding Waldo. So, who of you knows where's Waldo? Okay, good. Um, so, um, the idea here is that you, so on the next slide, there will be a picture of something, and somewhere in the picture, we will see Waldo, and the task is to find where Waldo is. So, this is a search problem because we have an input, the picture, and our task is to find the position of Waldo in this picture. Okay, um, yeah, it even works, great. Yeah, the resolution is not that high. Um, and now, a solution to that computational problem here is what? Yeah, that's a strategy, yeah, but... Um, so I, I, I meant to say basically that the coordinates of, of Waldo in this, in this image, right? And yeah, what is a strategy to arrive to, to solve this search problem? What do you mean by dividing into quadrants? And what do you do after you divide that? And when you use binary search, how do you decide which side to search? So you have to do the recursive. But how is that different from brute force? <laughs> Unless you have 
So I mean, you can, yeah, that might work. <laughs> so, I mean, you can do that. You can so search problems are always problems that can be solved more efficiently when you have multiple processes, so they can be parallelized. Because if you do brute force, then you have a range to to search, and searching at one place doesn't influence searching in a different place. So you can assign different different areas of the search space space to different processes. So a parallel search with this group should actually be quite fast. I didn't get that question. Uh, are we to this? So <laughs> yeah, no. So, yeah, um, yeah, Waldo well, is here. Uh, and so, yeah, you probably agree that it takes quite a long time to find Waldo. Uh, so, search problems can be expensive. But they, search problems always have the property that uh, there is, so if you have additional advice, if you have, yeah, then they can be solved much quicker. And for example, uh, useful advice for this search problem could be this one here. And uh, you can kind of, I mean, here the advice is the solution, but still, um, it means that, I mean, I could, I could also draw a, a circle here. It will also be advice, but it would be wrong advice, but still you can check it. So you can, you can take a look here and see if Waldo is there or not. He's not there, so advice was wrong. You can continue searching somewhere else and so on. But if the advice is correct, then it speeds up the computation tremendously. Good. Um, yeah, so I think I already said all of that. Oh yeah, there's a connection to zero knowledge. Um, who have you heard of zero knowledge, zero knowledge proofs and stuff? Okay. Um, in zero knowledge, there's always the statement that you can prove something, you can prove a property about something without revealing why it's true. Yeah, that doesn't really catch it, but the thing is, um, Zero knowledge allows you to verify. Uh, okay, in the Waldo example, I would be able to uh, convince you with the zero knowledge protocol that Waldo is actually present on the picture. I mean, there could also be the the uh, the case that Waldo just is not ins inside that picture, and uh, I could convince you that Waldo is present in the picture without showing you where Waldo is. So. And where Waldo is, is, is this witness, is this advice we've just seen. So, and uh, in zero knowledge, the witness is exactly the, the thing that you don't learn. You learn that Waldo is part of the uh, uh, picture, so the decision problem, the, the, the verification problem, that's what you can solve, but you don't learn the witness. Good. Um, yeah, what does this all have to do with blockchain? Because this is about, supposed to be about blockchain, right? Um, let's take a look at some code. This is uh, code in a weird language called Solidity. Um, and it's, it's, it's supposed to be a snippet of a multi-signature contract where we have a list of owners, so that's an array of addresses, and we can remove an owner uh, when we provide the address of the owner to remove. And what do you, how do you remove an element of a list? You search for the element, uh, this find owner pause does that, and then, yeah, that's a trick C++ developers know, I guess. So once you've found the, the element in the list, you swap it with the last element, and then you reduce the length by one. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you take the last element, store it at the point where the owner you want to remove is, and then you remove the last element. And find owner pause, uh, this just goes through the list brute force. It checks every single element in the worst case, and if it found the owner, it returns to position. Otherwise, it, it reverts, it throws an exception. So do you roughly get what this does? 
good. Now, um, this is obviously a, a search problem, so advice should help here. And what is the advice here? Obviously, uh, the position of the owner is the advice that can speed it up, because then we don't have to compute it here. And the problem again, advice, we can't trust advice, so one thing we have to do is we have to check that at that position, the owner is actually the one we want to remove. But once we have that, uh, it, it works fine. So we can call this smart contract function, we have to provide the precision, and then it's much faster than before. Um, yeah, the problem is, how do we find the position? Okay, we have to look into storage, and yeah, that, that's already difficult, but uh, the good thing is that we already know, we already have this function that finds us the, the owner, so um, we could modify the language to provide an annotation for these witness arguments uh, about how to compute them. So this, this part in brackets here is not part of the smart contract code that is, part, is on the blockchain, but this is run off-chain. And um, yeah, and we can even insert a fallback mechanism that says if the owner, if, if the advice is wrong here, then we fall back to actually searching for the owner on chain. And this has the advantage that uh, if we have a race condition, a timing problem between two transactions that remove owners, then the second if, if we don't add that line, the second transaction will fail because it has the wrong position, or might have the wrong position. And uh, if we add the fallback mechanism, then the second transaction will not fail, but it will be more costly, which could also be a big problem. Good, so, um, yeah, how can advice help blockchains? Uh, we've seen, yeah, we, we all know that on-chain execution is expensive, that's why we want to take stuff off-chain. And uh, taking stuff off-chain often turns these computations into verification problems and not computation problems, or at least the, the computation happens off-chain and only verification remains on-chain. And uh, we can use advice to speed up that verification. And this often leads to the problem that the same logic is implemented both on-chain and off-chain. And my yeah, proposal, which is very small proposal. Do you want to ask a question? Or? Yeah. Okay, let me just finish, then this, this last slide. And uh, we could add language features uh, to smart contract languages that basically compute this advice, and this might even turn into a language where that can model both the on-chain and the off-chain parts so that we don't have to uh, implement everything twice. And yeah, one the problem of this whole mechanism is that if we only verify stuff on-chain and don't compute it anymore, then we often have the case that the state is not fully stored on-chain anymore, which means we have to implement additional state databases for every single application, which uh, creates new problems, but at least it's efficient then. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Awesome. So we had a question. Okay, jumping down. Uh, great talk. Um, so uh, this is very similar to the kinds of trade-offs you make building uh, JavaScript applications today for the web. It's pre-compilation. Uh, Facebook yeah. has a project called Prepack. Um, you can think of it like server-side rendering or transpilation problems. It seems like is what you're advocating. The bracket syntax was like a allow me to execute the find owner pause function ahead of time and then mm -hmm. call more efficiently at runtime with that argument. Is that conceptually the idea? Yeah, I mean, it, ahead of time, so it's done off-chain. That's the main main difference, right? I don't know the, so it's I didn't work with server-based server stuff much, but I would guess that this translates to com compute stuff ahead of time, time on the server so that it doesn't have to be computed on the client or it's the other way around. You could think about it as either build time Transpilate like compilation, but I guess it's always runtime dependent. Yeah, it's always so, runtime. So it's essentially more. It would be more akin to like server-side rendering uh, it in real time. So like 
in, in the web, you server-side render user interfaces because it might be faster to do mm. so, and then send the, the uh, compiled output, and then you can what we call rehydrate the client, and mm. essentially that's kind of the verification pass. So it, it pattern matches heavily for yeah. me being a web developer in that, and a framework developer in the web space. So it's very interesting. I'd be really curious to talk more about your thoughts there. Yeah, awesome. You. We have another. We have more time for another question. Any other questions? Anyone eager? Oh, there was someone pointing. Oh, there you go. Sorry, you're behind me. My blind spot. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, so my question is: uh, So we can implement the same advice from uh, from a D app side, right? So I can make queries to blockchain. You know, get some some you know computations on D app side and include the transaction, right? Uh, I didn't get that. Sorry. Yeah, like uh, I, I can make this off-chain computation from the app side, right? Yeah. Uh, and just uh, so, what is the advantage uh, uh, making it on language layer uh, over on the app layer? It's kind of yeah, it, it saves implementation. So you you. I mean, if it's part of the smart contract, then it's also kind of generic. So uh, everyone who wants to call that function knows how to uh, compute the witness correctly. <laughs> Any more questions or I'm doing my search problem now. Ah, oh, yes. Found you binary search. Uh, hi. Um is there for every computational state tr transition problem uh this mapping for two way verification problems is it feasible for every type of state transition? I mean it, it it's doable, yes. So you just rerun the computation, and at the end, you add a comparison. Okay. I mean, it's not faster. It's yep. actually slower, but, but still, it turns okay. it into this kind of problem. I mean, like the um, turning in, um, into a verification problem inside of a smart contract. I mean, if you do the computation and then the verification afterwards, you don't get anything from it. So it's not always faster. It, it, you can't do that for all problems. But there are some problems, especially these, these search problems, where you can extract the witness, and then with the witness, it's faster. I mean, this is kind of the, yeah, if you have an, a problem in NP, then uh, you usually have a uh, faster problem that just does the verification. OK, so for every um, search problem, definitely. Unless the search space is one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. OK, thanks. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, can we give Christian a round of applause? That's awesome. Thank you.